Good afternoon. <laughs> so um, now if this were an undergraduate class, absolutely everyone would be in the last row. So I know that, I know that there are some parents here. Uh, my name is George Hornberger. Uh, I'm a professor here, uh, a split appointment between engineering and the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Uh, so I taught a class this past semester. It was a graduate class on the water energy nexus. And I thought that I would just play off that class to give this lecture. Uh, we, it was a graduate class, and we read a lot of papers and did a lot of technical things. And so uh, if you get tired of looking at partial differential equations, just <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, I, believe me, I've, uh, I, I've made it into, a, I ho hope, a an uh, informative presentation. Now, my class did get used to me after ooh, maybe half the semester, and they got used to interrupting me if I said something outrageous or if I if they wanted clarification. Uh, and I don't have half a semester with you, so I'm counting on the fact that uh, you have more experience, at least the parents in the audience. And so, if uh, it, it'd be a lot more fun for you and for me if to interact rather than to just listen to me uh, go on, although. I don't have any trouble doing that. <laughs> OK, so oh, I'm, that's right. This is high tech, so I get to do this with a wireless. OK, so uh, what, I, what I wanted to talk about is uh, really some interconnections that we don't often give a lot of thought to uh, as we plan things and as we plan our resource use. And in particular, I want to focus on energy, water, and food. And I pulled this list off a Smalley Institute. Rick Smalley at Rice had done oh, some surveys and tried to do some futuristic thinking and think about what the big problems facing humanity would be over the next several decades. And this is his list. And I didn't reorder the list. This is the way his list came out. And what you see is energy, water, and food. He didn't have them in red, but I highlighted them to uh, to make the point that uh, these are issues that people really do think about. And you'll notice that the others uh, are also things that we often think about as we read the op-ed pages or the, the news and, and have some concerns over these other things. But anyway, we're going to focus on three things that arguably are pretty important. Just a, a couple of little background things. What you'll see is I'm going to do, we're going to talk about a little bit about current conditions, if you will, but also we're always interested in looking forward. What the, if we're going to plan on resource use, if we're going to try to make sense out of uh, the, the, the world's future, we have to project a little bit into the, the future, at least. And uh, that's always uh, a dangerous thing to do. Uh, I think it was Niels Bohr, a famous physicist, who said, uh, the quote is that prediction is really difficult, especially with respect to the future. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that is true, uh, certainly for scientists and also certainly natural scientists and social scientists. At any rate, the population, we anticipate, uh, well, we're somewhere arguably, this slide would suggest that five and a half billion. I've seen figures at six billion. You've probably seen that. And as we project forward, uh, our estimates vary, but certainly I think the 8 billion figure here is a little on the low side. Maybe 9 billion. I've even seen 10 billion. We're talking about increasing significantly the number of people that live on this planet, and that means that uh, we have to provide the resources, the energy, food, and water resources needed for these people. Uh, the other thing is I will point out that uh, it's, it's tempting for us to think, aha, all of our problems really devolve to the population problem, that if we didn't have an increasing population, we would be home free and clear. And I would uh, point out to you that that really isn't true, because we have the underdeveloped countries, and the resource uses, uses the amount of resources we use in the West, or the developed countries, is uh, immensely greater than the resources used in the rest of the world. And as the rest of the world moves toward our per levels of per capita consumption, 
That's really what's driving. That's a stronger driver of our resource needs in the future than is this population. Nevertheless, we do have to supply resources for uh, a larger segment uh, of humanity. Well, you know, again, just to indicate to you that there are other people, not just uh, I, who've thought about this. This is from the National Intelligence Council. They put out a report. These are people who sit around trying to think about scenarios for the country, and w they worry about uh, relationships with national security and how we're going to prevent wars, things like this. And you'll notice here, what do they say? Hydro highly strategic resources, including energy, food, and water. And the demand is projected to easily outstrip our ability to provide in the future. And in fact, a lot of these people think that they're, they're, one of their worries is that future wars will be fought over water. That's one of the, the, the things that you see routinely. OK, so what I'm going to do, even though I said I didn't want to uh, we make a mistake by talking about these things individually, that's what I'm first going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about energy, a little bit about water, a little bit about food. But I promise that then at the end, after we get a little bit of background statistics, uh, I'll try to bring it together and talk about the interdependencies. So uh, this is a, a figure that shows our energy, total energy use for the U.S. This is just for the U.S. now, but uh, the, the picture for the globe wouldn't be all that substantially different. <laughs> and uh, I, th I think that, well, so first of all, the size of the circle, that's the amount of energy. Okay, and so you can see back here in 1960, the circle is smaller. By 2004, much more higher use of energy, and then projected out to 2030. And so you see that that circle gets bigger. Our projected energy needs for the U.S. are substantially higher in 2030. So that circle gets bigger. Uh, the pieces, the wedges, just refer to the fraction of the energy that is supplied by various uh, sources. And so they're called out over here. And you can see that even out to 2030, oil, natural gas, coal, we rely on uh, very significantly. And there, if, if anyone who's done any serious analysis does not think that this is crazy thinking or pessimistic or anything else, this is reality. We are going to continue to burn fossil fuels well into the future. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, it does create some concerns, and so I'm sure you've seen the issues raised of energy security. We rely on uh, imports of oil, so foreign oil is a big fraction of, of, of the, uh, the liquid fuels that we use. And th these fuels don't always come from countries that are highly friendly to us. So the whole issue of uh, energy security is one that we, we are concerned about. We hear about coal, and you've seen the ads that are on television now about clean coal, because we worry about coal being dirty. Nevertheless, coal is a resource, and, and we will uh, certainly use it. Uh, the other things here obviously make up a significant, I don't want to dismiss it, it's a very significant part of our portfolio, but it's not the bulk. So. Uh, of course, we, we see a lot in the, in, in the news now that we're, we, uh, uh, to move toward ener energy security, we want to make more use of renewables. And certainly, we need the research to figure out how to uh, develop renewable energy resources. But uh, again, I want to point out that it's pretty sobering if we start to think about the amount of energy that we need. And I pulled this from uh, talk that Nate Lewis at Caltech is fond of giving, powering the, the globe. Uh, so if we wanted to move away from carbon-based fuels significantly by 2050, which is what all the projections are that you see, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to stabilize to 1990 levels of carbon dioxide emitted uh, by 2050. Here's what we'd have to do. We'd have to build a new nuclear power plant somewhere in the world every other day, starting now until 2050. This isn't going to happen, right? And you can see the levels that we would have to uh, go to to s solve, if you like, the carbon-free energy 
uh, issue using uh, renewables or, in this case, nuclear. Okay, so it, again, it's just a, a sobering thought, and I want to, again, make the point. We look at that, the size of that circle, we are going to be using fossil fuels into the future. Okay, uh, this is my favorite part because I'm a hydrologist. <laughs> Okay, and so this will be a much longer part of the talk then. <laughs> uh, I put this uh, up here first. Of course, hydrologists, we all uh, go back to the, the water cycle, the hydrological cycle, and uh, I'm sure that you may all think of your third grade geography class when we've <laughs> talked about uh, the water cycle, and it was probably done even before any of us were in third grade. Uh, but anyway, I do want to say just a little bit about the, the water cycle because it, it enters into a lot of uh, the discussion, particularly with the interactions. Uh, so we, we, we just have this cyclical motion of water, uh, and there are dependencies here. And so if we use groundwater, uh, it will affect the water table, not so much the water chair, but the water table. Uh, it, <laughs> people uh, are concerned about, uh, climate change, and one of the worries is that climate change might uh, accelerate the hydrologic cycle. And so we're concerned about what changes may occur in precipitation or evaporation. And it's linked to, you know, the large-scale circulation of the atmosphere that is really depicted there at the, the top part of this slide. Uh, you've all seen a diagram like this, probably not with these exact words, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you, can get, you get the picture. Uh, th another thing that I want to mention is that you'll see two terms that we use. We, we look at water withdrawals and we look at water consumption. Both are important. Water withdrawals include water that we take out of, let's say, the Cumberland River and use it to cool some of the, well, to, to condense some of the steam from a cycle uh, running a power plant on the Cumberland River. That water gets returned to the river, albeit somewhat warmer than it started, but the, the water is withdrawn but returned to the river. If we consider pumping groundwater to irrigate crops, that water goes to the atmosphere. It doesn't get returned to the stream or to the groundwater, and so that's what we call consumptive use. If we look at the patterns now of with water withdrawals, and water consumption, you see that we have both large withdrawals and consumption in both the Far East in uh, Europe and in, in the US. And uh, let's see, I think I have, so these top panels, again, what I wanted to indicate is that when we look toward the future, we are looking toward a future where we require more water, both more water withdrawals, but also more water consumption. So again, the pattern's consistent. We have an increasing population. We have an increasing demand for energy. We have an increasing demand for water. Uh, we talk, or you'll, you'll hear some things, or you'll read things in the newspaper or National Geographic that we have impending water crises. Uh, this, this doesn't mean that we're going to run out of drinking water. Drinking water is a small fraction of the water we use. What it really means is that we are withdrawing significant quantities of water. And of course, we have natural variability. And so we have droughts. We have times when, if you're from middle Tennessee, you know it's been raining for, it seems like, the past two weeks. We have periods of, of wet weather. And so we have to balance this. We can't count on having even the average amount of water. We have to plan for droughts. So if we look, people have looked at maps, and uh, this map indicates, let's see, the, the orange color is the, the, the one that is labeled physical water shortage. And this is a part of the world where 75% of the available water resources is being withdrawn to be used. Okay, and so there's, there's really no margin anymore for air. And you'll see that a big chunk of that is in the southwest of the U.S. and the Intermountain West. Uh, and that's exactly, of course, where we anticipate uh, precipitation declines over the next several decades. Food, okay. Uh, again, if you think about it and you think about the 
population. I said we're going to have a 50% increase in population. And furthermore, that population is actually going to, uh, if all of the indications are, as countries become uh, more affluent, they convert from more from cereals, grain crops, and eat more meat. And meat is uh, incredibly intensive in terms of, uh, of production of, of resources. But what you see here is, again, that the projection here, what, uh, from 200 to over 300, so a larger, more than a 50% increase projected in meat that's needed uh, by 20, even this is by 2020, certainly by 2030. And you see a significant increase in, in grain cereal production as well. So we have to keep up with this, right? This is, this is uh, where we're going. So at any rate, summarize quickly where I've been. Uh, population increase, demand for energy increase, demand for water increase, demand for food increase. So this is, this is what we're working with. Now what I want to do is talk a little bit about these interdependencies. Okay? And so I'll start out just energy for water. We don't tend to think of energy being all that big a part of our water supply. I don't think it's common knowledge. Uh, even when it is common knowledge, if you look at our regulatory and planning agencies, our water departments and our energy departments. Uh, they may talk to each other, but they're completely separate. Energy for water. So 3 to 4% of our total uh, consumption, energy consumption, goes to treating water. Either treating water to deliver it potable water to our taps, or treating wastewater before it's delivered. You say, oh, that's only 3 or 4%. 3 or 4%, you know, we're talking about 3 or 4% of that big circle that I showed you for energy. This is a lot of energy we use for, for water. So uh, there you see, 56 billion kilowatt hours is used for drinking water and wastewater services. So, uh, let's see, the numbers probably don't resonate. Uh, 56 billion kilowatt hours, so the average, I guess it's the average household use of energy in the US is uh, for electricity is so somewhere on the order of 10,000 kilowatt hours. So you're talking about a significant amount of energy for water supply, all right? So the picture on the top is uh, if you go to California and you think about where Californians get their energy, a lot of it comes from the Colorado River, wh where they get their water. A lot of it comes from the Colorado River. And if you look at a map, or if your geography is pretty good, or if you've driven across the country, you know that between the Colorado River and California, there are some mountains. Okay, and so the, that water has to be pumped uphill and then flow downhill. And so there are pumping costs, but there are also costs for end use. And that's a big use so that we heat water. And so I like to ask people, so you haven't interrupted me yet, so this lecture might be over in 20 minutes. <laughs> that won't disappoint you, I know. Uh, so running a hot water faucet for five minutes. So uh, you know, we typically might do that. So the men in the audience might turn on the faucet to shave in the morning. And five minutes isn't a long time to run your hot water, right? So it's equivalent to burning a 60-watt light bulb for how long? Somebody want to take a guess? Two hours. A day. It's good. You're good. You're, you're, you, got in the right, you got in the right ballpark. 14 hours. Okay. So the moral of that story is when I shave, I turn the tap off and on just to, to rinse my razor. But seriously, I mean, it's a, there are individual behaviors that can make a difference in terms of energy conservation. But you, again, you see the link here, the, the strong link between energy and water. We use a lot of energy. So in fact, I, I really uh, like to point to California. California uh, has had to figure this out. Anyone from California? Yeah, so see, Californians know, right? You, you know because you've had several uh, uh, basically regulatory legal requirements to conserve energy. And so California, by the way, Kudos to California. 
Uh, their per capita energy use in the state has been, it's actually declined a bit since about 1990. Uh, Tennessee, still, still going up. And so Tennessee uses, on a per capita basis, uses something like 60% more energy than the average California. Uh, at any rate, but I digress. That's the, the notion here is that if, you, if California looks at their energy usage because they had to conserve and uh, they had to really cut back because, again, they're, they're locked in by law to do this and to produce 20% of their energy using renewables by uh, 2020, I believe it is. So it's a very ambitious goal. And so they started looking at how they were using their energy. And they said, oh my goodness, you know, 19%, uh, 19% of their energy was going to water. And you can see the, the numbers here, it's phenomenal. So it turned out they were facing this increased energy demand, increased water demand. They didn't have enough of either. But what they found is that, in the short run at least, to cut back on their energy consumption, the best way they could do it was to conserve water. Okay, so that's the, that's the lesson that I have uh, from this side. So we have this linkage. And so places like California are starting to figure out that there is this interdependency between energy and water, and we can it's a win-win situation. If we can serve either, on either end, we, we help the, the other resource. Uh, there aren't too many places that have conned on to this, but, uh, but at least places like California have. Water for energy. Okay, so we talked a little bit about energy for water. Water for energy. So this is a story, maybe some of you saw it, it was about a year ago. Uh, some friends of mine at uh, Virginia Tech actually uh, did this study. And this was out of ABC News. Guess how much water it takes to burn just one 60-watt light bulb for 12 hours a day for one year? And the answer is 3,000 to 6,000 gallons of water, depending upon <coughs> how the electricity is generated. Okay, now not all of this is consumptive use. So again, remember the distinction between withdrawal and consumption. So this, these are withdrawal figures. Nevertheless, if you think about uh, evaporative cooling towers, that really is a loss. That's a consumptive use because the water is being returned to the atmosphere and not, say, back to the Cumberland River. So when we think about water use in household, if you th all of us, if we go home and we think, well, OK, um, in the US, yeah, we use quite a bit of water, and the figure that you often see is 100 gallons per capita per day. Uh, and that's about right, and that's our direct use, doing laundry, running the dishwasher, taking showers. And that doesn't sound like much now. However, if we try to link in, and I've also already linked in food production over here, anticipating that we're talking about the link with food as well. Uh, you'll see that electricity production, household electricity production, and food, the food that we eat, a, t a term that has been used as virtual water. People that, if, if a country exports beef, they're in effect exporting water because it takes a lot of water to produce a, a pound of beef. But you see that this is a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant water usage per household. And those of us who live in the southeast, uh, the, the maps that we often see about water shortages or uh, climate change impacts, we say, oh, we don't have to worry. We have lots of water. But it is sort of interesting because there's a link that we don't necessarily often think about. And so and the drought of, what, two years ago, extending uh, back a little farther than two years, and the basically the threatened water wars between Georgia and Alabama and Tennessee. Uh, the, the, the part that some people missed were, was that depending upon how you use the water resources, there might not be enough water to provide cooling for the power plants. And so if you, have to, if you don't have the cooling water, you can't run the power plants. And you have this uh, vicious cycle. So even here in the southeast, uh, we're, we're certainly not immune from these considerations. Okay, uh, even with renewables, we definitely have to think about have to think about water because we have these sometimes unintended consequences uh, like this. You know, the Farm Fresh and 
best get your produce now because we're switching to, to biofuel crops. But when, uh, of course, when Congress mandated that we move to a, f a higher fraction of ethanol use in our uh, gasoline, um, I don't think anyone had really thought through that the price of tortillas in Mexico City was going to go up. Okay, because there, there is this tension. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that it's not, all, it's not just a water quantity issue, but there are water quality considerations as well. And so this National Academy report, one of the things that they were concerned about, one of the things we are concerned about in this country is the pollution that results from fertilizer application. Okay, and so uh, biofuels, if we use a lot more fertilizer, we can exacerbate things. Uh, for, you say, well, fertilizer use, who cares? The, you probably all heard about hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, the, the dead zone that is growing outside the mouth of the Mississippi, uh, depleted oxygen. It's basically a fertilization problem. Okay, and so looking at that uh, and thinking about our shellfish production and things that we really do care about, uh, this is an, an issue. Okay, water for food. Uh, we go to that, and this is a, there's as I said, there's a term, uh, virtual water, and uh, this is the the, uh, the John Allen was credited with forming this term, and some of the statistics you see is well, your cup of coffee takes 40 liters of water to, uh, so let's see liters. If you're not used to thinking in metric, you can convert that to quarts and you'll be close. But you see a kilogram of beef, that's two pounds of beef, uh, 22,000 liters. And so that's roughly a thousand quarts for a pound of beef, if you like. So it takes a lot of water to produce food. Now again, what you have to remember is we have an increasing population. We have an increasing need to supply food for the world population. And this redounds on the, the, the water resource usage. In fact, if we look at the projections for the need for water to satisfy the uh, Millennium Goals for hunger, uh, it's actually pretty scary. It's scary to me anyway, because you know we're somewhere in here, and we basically need to double our water resource usage. And there are some uh, constraints. There are obviously tremendous constraints. And uh, we don't always have the people where the water needs are. Uh, and when we don't have the surface water supplies, we tend to uh, overuse the groundwater. And then that leads to issues as well. So we can talk about energy for food as well. Energy for food. So if we look at uh, one link, whoops, one link is through fertilizers. Okay, so we say, well, fine, we have a direct water use for, for, uh, for irrigation, and that is linked to energy, as we've talked about. But we also have this fertilizer issue, and uh, that is linked to energy. If we look at my friend Jim Galloway uh, did this slide. If we look at, uh, this is all normalized to uh, 19. 61 is 100 for all of these things. So we're plotting a lot of different things. But you can see that the fertilizer use has gone up tremendously relative to cereal production and meat production. And so in fact, by the widespread application of fertilizer, we have been able to feed, uh, we've been able to produce enough food to feed the world's population again. But we're looking uh, into the future. Um, fertilizer takes energy. so that. The basically nitrogen fertilizer is uh, what was made possible by the Haber-Bosch process. Uh, that revolutionized everything. We have a, a lot of reactive nitrogen put into the uh, system. But the, the key thing here that I wanted to point out, fertilizer accounts for 29% of, of uh, agriculture's en energy use. So again, you say, well, it's a fairly small fraction of our total energy use, but we use a lot of energy, and so that fraction, it, it really mounts up. Uh, until recently, I was always fond of, uh, it was then Senator Proxmire from Ohio many years ago, 
uh, was had a famous quote, a million dollars here, a million dollars there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. Now, of course, we used to be able to get it with billions. We may soon be at trillions with that quote, but uh, a little bit of energy, it mounts up. Okay, uh, I can't, uh, certainly can't end without talking a little bit also about the link to, the, the link to climate, okay, because that's certainly in the public consciousness now and we hear a lot about it. So um, some of you may have read Thomas Friedman's book, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded. The hot part is climate. Uh, the flat part is his idea on where we have a globalized system now, uh, intricate system. And of course, the population growth is the crowded. Uh, so climate change. So statistics would suggest that at least half of you in this room are uh, skeptics, uh, climate change skeptics at best, and perhaps even um, just think that the whole idea is crazy. So. I won't, I'm not going to try to convince you one way or the other, but I will point out a couple things. The top graph is carbon dioxide, and nobody disputes the fact that we are increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So right now, every one of us, on average, per capita use in the United States, we put 20 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere, each of us. And if you start thinking about how many years each of us can put 20 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and not have uh, carbon dioxide content change. Well, that's crazy, right? Another way I, I, I try to get statistics that people can relate to, uh, if you drive down the highway and if you sort of picture yourself every mile throwing out a pound of trash, that would be ludicrous, right? We'd, everybody up in arms. That's what we do for CO2. Every mile we drive, we throw a pound of CO2 into the atmosphere, okay? Well, we don't see it, nobody's dying from CO2, but my point is that nobody doubts that CO2 concentration has increased dramatically. There's no scientific dispute that we are well above the CO2 content that the atmosphere has seen for the past roughly two million years. Two million years is a long time, okay? It's probably longer than that. Uh, where we're headed, uh, without a doubt, is territory that we haven't seen on the Earth for a long, long time. So we are doing an experiment. Now, having said that, uh, you may or may not believe the bottom figure, or well, maybe you do believe the bottom figure because that's just measurements. We're not talking about models. And so the planet has gotten hotter, uh, but some people say yes, but it's just natural change. Well, maybe. Okay, but what I do want to convince you of is that we have increased the carbon dioxide content immensely. There's just no controversy at all about that. Okay, and almost all geophysical scientists believe that there's a link between carbon dioxide and the temperature increase that we're seeing. Um, it's, it's amusing, again, I digress. So there's a famous chemist, Arrhenius, and in, I think it was 1896, 1896, he sat down and he said, hmm, Carbon dioxide, that's a greenhouse gas, uh, traps heat. I think I'll do a calculation. He sat down and did sort of a, what we call a back of the envelope calculation and came to the conclusion that if we doubled CO2 content in the atmosphere, it would increase the temperature of the planet on average uh, five degrees C. Okay, now many, many years later, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, through very sophisticated models, lots of measurements, comes out and says, well, about two to four degrees. So Arrhenius, that was pretty interesting. So over, over a century, the estimates haven't really changed that much. Uh, how does it relate to what we're talking about? Well, if we look, about, look at projections, for example, here, uh, here are the projections related to climate change in terms of runoff volume. And what you'll notice is that places like Arizona and Nevada, California, all projected to decline. And so people in California, this is one of the reasons I think that th there has been more of a stimulus there to think about energy and water conservation. Uh, and if, if, if you think that that doesn't only matters to Californians, uh, you have to realize that California on a world scale has, I think, the fifth largest economy in terms of gross national product in the world. And that uh, they, <coughs> 
uh, I think something like 20% of that GNP is in agriculture products. So as, as you know, you go to the store, we all go to the grocery store, and you, you just notice how much of your produce comes from California. So this matters. So again, we think about energy relations, food relationships, water relationships, climate change. Yes? Well, it, it, it's, it's very difficult because when we think of adverse effects to too much water, this is sort of projections on average. So if we just went up on average, that would be okay. If what we're facing, and some people think this, is that the Red River of the North, where we saw this tremendous flooding this summer, is going to increase in frequency. And so we talk, hydrologists talk about the 100-year flood and the Red River of the North, where you all saw this Fargo piling up the sandbags this summer, that was saying, wow, that's a 300-year flood. What does a 300-year flood mean? It means it only happens once every 300 years. There are some people who think that it's now going to happen once every 30 years. And so it does have potential impact on our infrastructure. And so the climate change community, uh, we think in terms of mitigation, mitigation being if we can slow down or curtail the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, maybe we can keep these changes uh, mitigated, keep them down. But the other side of the coin is something called adaptation. We are going to, my boss on here, here's my belief now. My belief is we are going to have climate change, anthropogenic climate change. We're going to see more of it, and we're going to have to learn to adapt. And so it may mean moving Fargo a little farther away from the river. The slower changes we can, we can deal with. We can get into this discussion, but uh, there are some worries that we could see some very rapid changes that would be very hard to adapt to. Uh, it is interesting, I, uh, and so uh, let's see. I heard that the US Army has decided that we are going to move out of Guam because it's too low-lying, and in fact, we, they can't, you can't land planes in water. Okay? And so I think that's very interesting because here we have the U.S. Army taking things seriously. Oh, yeah, this slide is sort of out of place. I wanted to indicate that when we use water resources, there tend to be some impacts. And I like this slide because it shows uh, something that we, we, hydrologists we refer to as land subsidence. So when you pump water out of an aquifer underground, uh, the land often subsides. It compresses. And you say, well, how much? And so here's a slide over to the left. It's in California. That top panel says 1975. And the bottom one, I think, says 1930 or something. And they're marked off. OK, that's where the land was. Uh, I got this backwards. So that was, that's where the land was until they started pumping the aquifers under the San Joaquin Valley substantially. This is one from Mexico City. And that young man is not leaning against the telephone pole, which you might think. He's leaning against the well casing. So the well, you know, when you drill a well, you put down a casing, a pipe, basically, to contain things. And the land settled around the casing. And now the casing sticks way up out of the ground. Um, can, can you just talk to us just a second about a tipping point? <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's a great deal of discussion. Uh, and I would say that we're talking about tipping points, plural, because there are certain things that we don't. So let's see. So what's a tipping point? A tipping point might be uh, we have lots and lots of methane stored in something called clathrates, which in a solid form. These tend to be in the Arctic or uh, sub-seabed. Uh, in colder waters, let's say off the northwest, off Oregon, up toward Alaska. There's so much methane in those clathrates that if uh, they're temperature sensitive. If we increase the temperature enough, we'll melt them, basically, in common terms. Now we release methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. We tend not to worry about it quite as much as CO2 because it doesn't have as long a residence time in the atmosphere. But 
it will certainly warm the planet tremendously. And you can see that we call it a tipping point because once that starts, we might get more warming, more carbon released, more warming, more carbon release, and we can get a runaway effect. Or the tipping point that some people have talked about, you, well, you probably, maybe you've heard about the ocean conveyor belt, <laughs> uh, something called the thermohaline circulation. And uh, Wally Broker at Columbia popularized the term ocean conveyor belt. So um, the fact of the matter is, so if you've been to the north of England, um, on the west coast, on the Irish Sea, over off the, near the Lake District, uh, people are often uh, quite favorably impressed if you go there in the spring and you see azaleas and flowering plants all over. They shouldn't live at that latitude, okay? But why do they do? Because of the, the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream warms that whole area. The Gulf Stream is part of this conveyor belt. There's a very delicate point that we don't know about, that if we change the balance of fresh water and heat in the ocean, we could shut down. It, the ocean conveyor has shut down in the past. We could shut it down. That's a tipping point. So I could go on and on. I don't want to do that. Uh, there are people who are very concerned about this. There are people thinking about this. There's research being done trying to figure out. The, the best advice that most people give is, let's try to figure out how to slow things down so we don't reach 1,000 parts per million CO2 by the year 2100, which is where we're headed. And if we hit 1,000, we're, uh, whew, then it's a big experiment. Is, is there knowledge of what caused the correction that you showed on that historical chart? Uh, previous one? No, it was a couple charts before on CO2. Oh, here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're ice ages. OK. So and it, it's very interesting because uh, my colleague Bill Ruderman has suggested that anthropogenic climate change actually started roughly 8,000 years ago when people started cultivating rice and people started chopping down forest in big chunks. And it, it, Bill's a paleoclimatologist. And he's looked at these records and said, you know, we should basically be in an ice age now. And the fact of the matter is that 8,000 years ago, we started doing something that really changed the course of the, the, the global temperature. And now, of course, we're go going the other way. OK, so I can't conclude without telling you a little bit about uh, why I'm here. I spent a, a good part of my career, the bulk of my career, at the University of Virginia. Okay, and last year, uh, I talked to people at Vanderbilt, and they convinced me to come here and be director of a new institute we're forming called the Vanderbilt Institute for Energy and Environment. And so VIE, we basically are aiming to do uh, research that is very broad-based. Uh, our argument is that it's not just engineering that's going to solve these problems. It's not natural science. Just knowing what the tipping points are aren't going to answer the problem. We need to engage social scientists to figure out what leads people and institutions to behave in certain ways. We have to obviously involve the economists because this is not going to be free, regardless of what anyone tells you. It's going to be expensive. We have to engage uh, lawyers because there's a regulatory and legal framework that we have to, to deal with. At any rate, we want to deal with both the supply-demand context and what we call elasticity plasticity. Elasticity just means there are certain constraints that may be technical constraints. There are certain things that we can't, we can't do because they're technically not feasible. The plasticity side, there may be some things we can't do because we can't uh, adjust people's behavior. And that goes on both the supply and demand side. So over here uh, on the supply side, you see that the plasticity, say, well, facility siting. So we're all familiar with the fact that uh, even if we did want to build a new nuclear power plant every month for the next uh, 50 years, finding places to build such plants would be very difficult. And, and in reality, it's a constraint. So that's basically uh, what VIE is after. And uh, I'd be glad to, to chat at length about that. I'm very excited to be here. Vanderbilt's a wonderful place. I'm sure you all know that, having either been here yourselves or had your students here. So 
Tom Friedman says, hot, flat, and crowded, and I would argue thirsty and hungry as well. He could add those things. Uh, and we have these, you know, these interdependencies, food, energy, water. And if you think back to the other ones that were on Smalley's list, environment, that surely linked in. Poverty, I would, I would argue very definitely. Terrorism and war, as I said, people worry about the next wars being fought over water. Certainly, uh, energy, you can picture it. Disease, I haven't talked about those linkages, but we you know, guaranteed we have links to, between climate and disease, water and disease, food production, et cetera. Education, well, that's one of the things we're trying to do at VIEE to resolve part of that. Democracy, well, again, if you read Tom Friedman's book, he argues that there really is a link and that uh, he argues that some of the Middle Eastern countries, once you are awash in money coming in from uh, natural resources, uh, the pressure to have more democratic institutions uh, really disappears. Okay, so there's a link there, I would argue. And of course, population. And, and these things are interrelated. I don't have a sunset slide to end with from Nashville. I haven't been here long enough, but I did a sabbatical many years ago in uh, Australia. And the Peel Inlet is an absolutely wonderful little place in Western Australia, just south of Perth. I highly recommend a visit if you like to travel. Uh, there are great wineries there, too, in the Margaret River Valley.